By the time you get to the DCT, the only thing that's left to reabsorb is maybe some sodium, a little bit of water. of uh, aldosterone. Aldosterone will act at the DCT and it will facilitate sodium reabsorption and water will follow. Touch that before. studied before was um, presented in the endocrine chapter and it's right here. Let's see here. So re review that um, aldosterone is a steroid and when uh, presented to the appropriate cell and bind its receptor in the cytoplasm and turn on the genes and proteins and uh, it will make new channels and modulate existing channels that in the end will facilitate the reabsorption of sodium. Here I say water does not follow. ADH must be present for water for water to follow. Excuse me. Um, that's pretty much it. If you want those electrolytes, the sodium, the water will follow. Um, the DCT will then empty into a collecting duct. The collecting duct cells have two functions. One, you can either help form concentrated or dilute urine. And those cells that form that function are the principal cells. Because they have the aquaporins, AQP, they can form concentrated or dilute urine. Uh, the other function is acid-base balance. They're intercalated cells, and um, they can raise or lower pH of the blood for acid-base balance. All right, let's talk about number one first, and you can see a picture of concentrated or dilute urine side by side in the cup there. And um, the formation of concentrated or dilute urine, it depends upon if ADH is present or not. If ADH is present, it'll mobilize those aquaporin cells that we talked about before. And you can see water leaving the collecting duct in the presence of ADH to concentrate the, the filtrate forming concentrated urine at the bottom. Now here's the cell physiology of um, ADH that acts on the principal cells. So review ADH. It acts through a second messenger system to increase the uh, cyclic AMP signal. It mobilizes the aquaporins to move from the center of the cell to insert on the filtrate side and once the water pore is entered, water can follow its concentration gradient. Water is unable to slip in between the cells because of the tight junctions on this side. So that's what we learned before, and you should still know that. So if you have to review the action of ADH on, by studying this slide. And so here I have um, the functional range of forming concentrated or dilute urine at the collecting duct.
what you see on the left if the physiological condition of the body is overhydrated, overhydration. You have osmoreceptors in the brain that detect the dilute plasma. So the effect that has on the brain is to not release ADH. If there's no ADH, the aquaphorins aren't mobilized, and so what will happen to the collecting ducts? That dilute filtrate from the uh, DCT will stay dilute. You'll force it through the watertight collecting duct, and you'll increase the urine output of dilute urine. And so uh, basically the concentration is around 100, and the output is 6 liters a day. <coughs> 100 osmolarity at six liters a day. Okay, so that's the high end of urine output. That's how dilute the urine can get. In a state of, um, okay, so again, to be clear, we call this dilute urine. No aquaphorins because there's no ADH. If the body's in a state of dehydration, The increased saltiness of the plasma will cause the uh, pituitary to release ADH levels in the blood. So you increase the levels of, of aquaporins in those principal cells. And then um, <clears throat> the concentration would be 1,200 milliosmolar and an uh, output of about a half liter a day. So that, that's, this has all been calculated. This is the wide range of, abil of ability to concentrate or form dilute uh, urine, depending on the body's needs. Okay. The other thing I had on this slide on the right here for the formation of concentrated urine is the reinforcement of the osmotic gradient by urea. So I'm going to add that to this slide, to this side here. <clears throat> urea reinforces the osmotic gradient. It's just the mother molecule that'll hold, that'll help pull water out of the cells that have the aquaporins. And it can do that because urea is continually recycled at the bottom of the papilla, or at the bottom of the pyramid. So urea recycling, <clears throat> put this slide in. All you really need to understand, of course, you could read through the steps that I wrote. When urea is in the filtrate, and it goes up the loop of Henle, it's up here in the cortical region, there's no osmotic pull to pull urea out. But as it descends into a concentrated area, it can be pulled out. Some of it is recycled back into the filtrate, but some of it remains in this area of the medulla and creates a pool that helps further increase the uh, pulling of water out of the collecting duct in the presence of ADH. Okay. <clears throat> so to uh, talk about the other function of the collecting duct, let's remember that it's the principal cells that have the aquaporins, but the the part between you have these intercalated cells which perform the function of acid-base balance. And I want you to learn about what the type A and type B cells do. So this figure kind of illustrates it. talked about acid base balance before, we're talking about it again just as a primer for um, what I'm about to go into at the end of today's lecture. I, I, want, you, I want you to learn how to um, solve acid base balance problems given blood, blood values. But first, let's just learn another way the kidney can raise or lower pH. So in the type A cell, these are all intercalated cells. these molecules 
in the cell, let's say if it's, this is the type A, what it's showing you on the picture is that it's excreting the hydrogen ion. Of course, that needs to be buffered with something. And this is the blood side here. This is the filtrate side here. The blood is reabsorbing the base. So that cell will function if the pH is getting too low, because you're going to excrete the acid and reabsorb the base. So the pH of the blood is going to increase, and that will be a, compensa a renal compensation for acidosis. for the type B cells. If you have, if you just kind of rearrange the furniture, but now you stick the proton pump on the other side so that the blood receives the acid and you excrete the base and the filtrate. Well, that would help to acidify the blood. That would help to lower pH to compensate for alkalosis. depending on what the need is. Okay. The normal range for blood pH of the blood, NL is normal, is 7.35 to 7.45. You want to kind of keep it within there. So now that we've talked about the collecting duct and the formation of concentrated or diluted urine, we'll, we'll get to other things. But for example, if I were to show you any picture and you know which side's the filtrate, and you know which side the blood is, could you answer this question? Is what's shown A or B? B, because you're excreting the base. So just, you know, got to remember what A and B is. Once you form the urine by the kidney, you, have, you can void it in the bladder. Your ureters will carry the formed urine down to the bladder, shown here. And it's dissected open. Let's remember we have uh, male and female because the urethra is a different size. Let's remember in, in the male that the penis contains part of the urethra, increasing the length. Ureters, and they're not really shown in this picture, but they do descend retroperitoneal. Remember, the kidneys are retroperitoneal. The ureters are retroperitoneal. The bladder, it, it's in the pelvis. It's also underneath the peritoneum. So you got two ureters. Well, let's draw the bladder first. Big old bladder. Here's the urethra. And uh, the bladder wall. The ureters will descend retroperitoneal, and they'll go all the way to the base of the bladder. See one there. Maybe another one there. And there will, there will be this kind of three-pointed triangle there. And they call that the bladder trigone. the trigonid of the bladder. And the bladder trigonid hey, has three points, right? And you can see two of the corners are two, ureter <coughs> two ureteric orifices. You know, right, right here. Let me kind of draw that a little more better. Right, right at the corner. Right. 
That bottom corner is created by the, uh, the orifice created by the internal urethral sphincter. urethral sphincter. What's happening there is um, the muscle, the muscular bladder wall is called detrusor and it's created by a smooth muscle. I'll call it red for detrusor in the bladder wall there. When the muscle fibers of the truther get close to the bladder trigone, they form a sphincter around it. So some muscle fibers of the truther, oh, I'm going to write that on the board. The truther is smooth muscle of the, the bladder. It's the muscle of the bladder. When you contract it, it squeezes the bladder <coughs> and, and voids it of urine. And that's really the job of the urinary bladder. It's a muscular holding chamber for the urine. Well, anyways, the detrusor fibers help form this internal urethral sphincter. Okay, right? Right there. So I want you to know that the internal urethral sphincter, the fibers are derived from detrusor. So it's all smooth muscle. Okay. And that creates the third corner of bladder trigone. So you got two ureteric orifices and the internal urethral sphincter to help store urine in the bladder. <clears throat> the ureters are delivering the urine. And the bladder trigone has these grooves, kind of like a little water slide. So you're filling the bladder from the base and you're filling it from bottom up. Okay. And as long as the internal sphincter is shut, it, it'll keep urine stored in the bladder until it's time to void. Uh, one thing about how the ureters work, I, mean, I can't really show you this way, like for example, the, um, the ureters, they pierce the bladder wall at an oblique angle. That's an important thing to know. Ureters Here's bladder wall at an oblique angle. So that when the bladder fills with urine, the bladder wall will stretch, and the stretching will pinch off those orifices so you don't backwash urine back up to the kidney, which can happen actually in certain cases. I mean, if you have a wall and you, and you want it to drill straight through at a 90, perfect 90 degree angle, when the, when the wall stretches, it wouldn't really pinch off. It would actually make the orifice larger. But if you were to um, kind of like pierce at an oblique angle, when the bladder wall stretches, it would actually shut it off. Okay. So that's why I wanted to note that. That's important to know. And um, the other thing is, yes, the, the bladder will fill with urine and stretch. And let's remember the epithelial tissue that winds the bladder wall. It's, it's a transitional ET. A transitional epithelial tissue can distend. It can stretch. That's one of the properties of the uh, epithelial tissue when we teach that in 430. We want you to remember for now. An empty bladder will be deflated and wrinkled on the inside. And for those of you who saw the cadaver dissection, I showed you that, right? The rugae <coughs> are the wrinkled, is the wrinkled appearance of the mucosa on the inside of the bladder wall when it's empty. You see the bladder trigone there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for the anatomy of the urinary bladder. 
I should note one other sphincter. There is an internal urethral sphincter, there is an external urethral sphincter. I'll just kind of draw another one here. This one is within the UG diaphragm, as the picture indicates. So it's, it's skeletal muscle, it's voluntary muscle. External. Sphincter. So this is one you can control with conscious thought to help you hold it in when your bladder is full. So the bladder fills from bottom up. I mean, you can start to feel the presence of urine in your bladder at about 200 ml. Okay. At 200 ml, what will happen is um, the afferent nerves will start to send signals to your brain. Call them afferent volumes. <clears throat> it's simply interpreted as the urge to go, right? And as it fills up and fills up, the volleys become more frequent and intense. Increase in frequency, intensity. And I've read that, you know, the max capacity is about a liter. Maybe a little more, a little less, something, something like that. Okay. And um, well, I do want to teach you about the, the bladder reflexes. <clears throat> One thing before I raise this is, let's not confuse ureter with urethra, and that the transitional epithelium it lines most of the urinary tract. Okay, from ureter to urethra. Here's the female uh, ureter, bladder, urethra. Uh, the female urethra is shorter in length, um, which makes the female urinary tract more prone to UTI, simply because the bacteria have a shorter distance to travel to reach the bladder. I want to focus on the bladder reflexes that help you store or avoid the bladder. <clears throat> so instead of reflexes, I want to go through all the nerves that you'll have to know. Study the um, afferent division. Afferent is sending the signal to the brain, to the central nervous system. Remember that the nerves have a, a pseudo unipolar design, like uh, for sensory information. And study the pelvic nerves. For the efferent division, well, you have to study somatic and autonomic. For the somatic nervous system, study the pudendal nerve that innervates the external urethral sphincter. That's the voluntary muscle one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pudendal. So let's remember those nerves are, the cell body is in the, um, the ventral horn of the gray matter. And it has all these, well, it has one long axon as an extension there. 
Uh, the pudendal nerve is the one you got to know. It innervates external urethral sphincter for the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> We have sympathetic parasympathetic. For the sympathetic division, study the hypogastric nerves. While the pudendal innervates the um, external sphincter, the hypogastric nerves, they're going to innervate the bladder, the bladder, the, the detrusor muscle, and the internal sphincter. This is for smooth muscle. So it says on the slide there. And let's remember that autonomics have a pre and post ganglionic fiber. <clears throat> so there's a pre and a synapsis to a post. <clears throat> the parasympathetic nerves for the bladder reflexes are the pelvic splanking nerves. So these are the nerves that you have to understand for how you hold it in, your storage reflexes, and how you avoid your bladder. And it's outlined on the next slide right here. So let me walk you through first how to hold it in. And how the figure is uh, arranged is that they show you the bladder on the bottom. Looks like it's full. Not the, when it's deflated, it's shaped more like a flat pyramid, but it's all full there. Um, you have the internal, you have the external sphincter. They do show you a piece of brain stem, because that's where these reflex centers are in the pons. They show you um, a lumbar or thoracic level of spinal cord, because that's where sympathetic function is. And the sacral division, uh, well, the sacral region is where the parasympathetic division uh, function is. So that's why they show you one slice of each. So when your bladder is full and you're you know, holding it in, trying not to let urine dribble out, Expression, hold it in. Well, anyways, look at the top there. It says pontine storage center. Um, that, that can help. But the first thing I actually want to note is how the reflex works. So you can kind of like store urine in the bladder without even thinking about it. This is a reflex loop. It's called the somatic loop. Number one, study the somatic loop. Just to kind of outline it a little bit, what they're showing you there is that the afferent pelvic nerve. It, it senses a full bladder. And it's going in the spinal cord and it's synapsing on a pudendal nerve, which is going to the um, external sphincter, external urethral sphincter. So this is the pelvic nerve. It's carrying the afferent information in the spinal cord, and it's synapsing directly onto the efferent nerve, pudendal. Because pudendal innervates the external sphincter, you shut it and you help store urine in the bladder. So that's what's called the somatic loop, so those two nerves. It's just kind of in and out. It's just a loop. One thing to notice is that this somatic loop, it can be influenced by the brain. Can receive brain input from, well, like I said, at the top. <clears throat> it's the pontine storage center. Can receive input from.
So what they show you there is a nerve fiber coming all the way from the top. And it's synapsing on that pudendal nerve as well. So that, that's what I mean by the brain influence thing. It's like the bladder is really full and you're making a conscious effort to hold it in. Right? So you can get to the restroom. Uh, well, the other thing that's not a part of the somatic loop are the hypogastric nerves. The sympathetic response is to help you hold it in. Well, there's a nerve fiber here going up to the uh, sympathetic efferents. So those are pre and post ganglionics for the hypogastrics. They're inhibiting the trucer. They're stimulating the internal sphincter. So that's what you should know. Second thing, hypogastric nerves, they're being stimulated. So one, now in, I'll put a negative sign for inhibition. Negative sign, detrusor. So you don't squeeze the bladder. You don't stimulate detrusor. And you, and you stimulate the internal urethral sphincter. Okay, so all of these things, you're stimulating the external sphincter, I'll put a plus sign here, you're stimulating the internal sphincter and you're inhibiting the trucer, that, that's what's happening when you feel the urge to go. And then what do you do? You get up, you go to the bathroom, and then you actually go, you void your bladder not shown on the right. So as you can see, there's a fiber that goes all the way up and triggers the pontine micturition center. And what will happen is a little bit of urine will start to dribble down to the internal sphincter. And once it gets to that, voiding is imminent. That's kind of what the textbook says. All right, so void. You stim, stimulate the pontine. What does pontine mean? Pause. And what I would do is follow the, the, the parasympathetic efferent effects of that center. And there's three of them. diagram up there. There's three things. Okay, number one. The first thing it does is going to inhibit, there's a little fiber there, it's inhibiting the hypogastric. It's like you're inhibiting the inhibitory nerve. Okay, so let me write that down. So you inhibit hypogastric. say is you're inhibiting the inhibitory. You're inhibiting the thing that kept you from voiding the bladder. So ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to remove the inhibition on the detrusor muscle and you're going to stop stimulating the internal sphincter. So remove the 
ambition. On the trucer. Stop the stimulation of internal urethral. All right, so um, that's the first thing. Now the second thing is if you follow it all the way down to here, you're doing a couple of things. You're stimulating the pelvic splanchnic nerves. of that is to stimulate the true serve. Stimulate the true serve. And inhibit the internal sphincter. That's what it's showing me. Second thing. The third thing is to inhibit pudendal. That's right there on the figure. It's all listed here. Inhibit the pudendal nerve. And what that does is you're going to inhibit or stop stimulating the, the external sphincter. Stop stimulating uh, the external urethral sphincter. Okay, so those are all the things. Basically, both sphincters are going to open. And you're going to squeeze the bladder. You're stimulating the trucer. That'll help you avoid. There's other things that happen. You can track your abdominal muscles to increase the, the intra-abdominal pressure. There are other things. Uh, but these are the things just concerned with the, the urinary tract. <clears throat> are there any questions on any of those nerve functions? So we're going to shift gears here. You know, spend some time uh, remembering uh, those nerve names. I'll explain the kind of gastric. I think it'll be okay. Uh, one of the things I'll have you do on lecture exam seven, um, your author calls it sleuthing. Um, it's, it's using blood values to, ter to determine the cause of acid base imbalances, either acidosis or alkalosis. So let me show you these um, different cases here, these eight possible diagnoses. And um, this part of the lecture is based on page. Um, 34 is a good reference page. Smoothing. They're using the whole blood value statement. Okay, so to give you a background on how to solve these problems, you already have the background. You, you studied respiratory, and we just got through with the kidney. And the things that I would um, have you remember let's say, for example, Something's wrong with the lungs. So you have a respiratory 
um, cause of the acid base imbalance? Respiratory acidosis, or it could be an alkalosis, too high or too low. The first thing you should commit to memory is that the normal pH range, this is what we're trying to figure out, the normal pH of the blood should be in the range of 735 to 745. And if, for example, um, the pH is too high or too low, the thing you want to look at for a respiratory cause is the partial pressure of CO2 in the, in the blood. And in the blood, the partial pressure of CO2 it should be within a normal range of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So the NL is normal, 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. It's a coincidence that it's 35, 45, and 7.35, 7.45 for the pH. That's just a coincidence. But that, that's the thing to consider for respiratory causes of acidosis or alkalosis. And so for example, if the pH of the blood comes back 7.2, is that too high or too low? It's too low. And let's say I'm just going to tell you it's a respiratory acidosis. The thing to look at is the partial pressure of CO2. And what you would expect to see is that that value, let's say for example 46, it should be high if it's causing a low pH. Now the reason for that, you have to remember your chemistry here, if you hydrate the CO2 with H2O, right, remember that? You get carbonic acid, H2CO3, which partially dissociates, it's a weak acid, but it can generate acid. So that's why if you have too much CO2, the law of mass action says too, too many uh, reactants here, you push the equation this way give you more acid. And so that's why a high CO2 can drive down pH if it's a respiratory cause. Maybe there's impaired gas exchange, maybe there's emphysema, cystic fibrosis. Something's going on to where the lungs are impaired and they're causing a system-wide low pH in the blood. But the reverse is true. Let's say you're hyperventilating. and you're breathing off too much CO2. So that value is low, say 30. And then maybe it, it's a distress, it causes a respiratory alkalosis, and maybe the pH is too high, maybe 7.6. Okay, just kind of teaching concepts here. So th that thinking is if the um, molecules here are too low, you push the equation this way, so you're removing acid from the blood. So that'll drive the pH up. Okay. So the trend that you should see by looking at the PCO2, if the value of the pH is, oh, I'm sorry, that's too low, is too low, and the cause is respiratory because that value is too high, just remember, if that's low, the pH is low, PCO2 is high. The inverse is true, the pH is high. It's because the PCO2 is low. So that's why I, I say on the slide there, respiratory opposite. Because if it's a respiratory cause, it's kind of the inverse. You got this high, low, or, or high low, uh, depending on if it's acidosis or alkalosis. That, that's kind of the correct procedure for evaluating a respiratory cause of acidosis, alkalosis, look at PCO2. Now for a metabolic cause, that's kind of the renal mechanism. I don't know why they call it metabolic. I'm gonna go with that.
metabolic acidosis, alkalosis. This is the renal mechanism. Renal mech. And the value you want to look at is the base. The, um, yeah, bicarbonate. And the units are milli equivalent per liter. And the normal range is going to be 22 to 26. So now we're looking at something different. We're just looking at straight up base. And that's the normal range. So again, for the just for an example, um, is that value too high or too low? Let's say it's too low, because it is. The normal range is still 735, 745. So immediately, is that acidosis or alkalosis? If it's too low, acidosis. And just, I'm going to tell you, let's say it's a metabolic acidosis. If it's the base, that's driving the pH too acidic, you don't have enough of it. So let's say this value should be 20, something like that. For base, is that value high or low? 20. Low. It's below the low end of the normal range. So that's low base causing low pH. And the reverse is true. If the pH were, say, too high, 7.50, and it causes a metabolic alkalosis, the, um, well, what would drive it up if it's a metabolic cause is too much base in the blood, so maybe, uh, so I'll just say 28. So the trend there is, if you have high base, high pH. That's why I say uh, metabolic equal, because if it's a metabolic cause, low equals low, high equals high. So that's why the Rome thing is an easy memory jogger. But I mean, it should be, it should be more than that. You should understand the physiology. I mean, if you pass chemistry, you should understand that base, how that affects pH. If you have low base, yeah, it's going to make the blood more acidic. Same thing over here. If you have high CO2, why, why is that a cause of acidosis? It acidifies the blood when it combines with water. So you're supposed to understand that as well. And then so what I'll do is I'll keep it to those eight possible scenarios. Okay. And so the best way to, to practice is to go through a few of them. But before I erase this, is there any questions on Rome? Respiratory opposite metabolic equal. Okay, I'll erase this. Are you going to show chemical uh, chemical formula? No. No. Mm -hmm. I think the chemical formula will be the what chemical formula? Are you going to say that you shift the, the CO2 plus H2O to the right if the uh, PCO2 is too, uh, too high? No. Are you and the other thing you should commit to memory are the, uh, the normal ranges. 735 to 745, 35 to 45, 22 to 26. Okay. So the blood values I have to give you are those three, the pH, the PCO2, and the bicarb. Okay, look on page 1034, it's the same kind of, it'll reteach you what I'm teaching you now. So just for practice, let me write the normal ranges now. pH, 7.35, 7.45. For the partial pressure of CO2 in millimeters of mercury, it's 35 to 45. And for bicarb, your base, in milliequivalents per liter, it's 22 to 26. 
And so just list them as steps. Look at one, look at two, look at three. And let's say that the fourth thing is your diagnosis. Now we'll, we'll keep it to one of those eight. So what I would have to do, I, mean, I got a few examples here. I'll just give you those first three things so you can solve it. I'll do the first couple with you. Let's say, for example, the blood values come back 6.9, 29, 19. So let me take you through the stepwise process. We'll do a couple, and then I'll let you try a couple. Hopefully, by the end of it, you'll figure it out. The first thing I do is I look at number one, the pH, and I just say, is that too high or too low? Well, it's too low. So immediately for my diagnosis, I could bubble, I could write in acidosis. I'll get that part right. Then I just look at the next value. I'm trying to, now I'm just trying to determine the cause. Is it the lungs or is it the kidneys that are causing the problem? Because if one of those are causing the problem, what you, the, the last thing you have to ask is, is the other system compensating? For example, if the lungs are causing the problem, are the kidneys compensating? If the kidneys are causing the problems, are the lungs compensating to help? And so I look at this. That's low. This value is 29. Is that normal range, high, low? That's low. But that's not the cause, because what was our rule? It's high, low, not low, low. We'll come back to that. That's low. All we say for now is, that's not the cause. And move on to number three. Assess that value, 19. That's low. So what we can assume, low, low, low base, low pH, so I'm going to circle that. That's the cause. So we know it's a renal, uh, renal mechanism we call metabolic, metabolic acidosis. So that's the kidneys. The kidneys are the problem. Now ask yourself, are the lungs trying to compensate for that? So let's go back and assess number two, the 29. And you say to yourself, huh, okay, well, let me just put it this way. If it's outside the normal range, it is compensating in all the problems we're solving. Let's try to make sense of that. Our problem is a low pH. What does low CO2 mean? If this is low, you're breathing it off. That'll drive the equation this way. So it helps the body to get rid of acid. So the, it is trying to help. So what we say is it's a metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Okay, before you ask any questions, let, let, let's do another one, and then I'll let you ask questions. Let's say the values come back uh, 7.2, 7 36, 20. Just go through the steps again. Evaluate number one. 7.2, is that high or low? That's low. So you say again, it's acidosis. In this person. Then you try to assess the cause. Evaluate number two. 36 is in the normal range. Is that the cause? No, it's not the cause. It's not the lung. Now evaluate this value. Uh, well, it's 20. It's, it's low. So low, low. Uh, I'll circle that in red again. It's a metabolic 
acidosis. Now, to assess if the respiratory system is compensating, if the value is within the normal range, it's not doing anything. It's not compensating. Okay, you, so you just stay without compensation, without respiratory compensation. Okay, at this point, are there any questions? Between what? These first two? Well, one has compensation one doesn't. and one doesn't. Right, but how do, how do I tell again? Well, how you tell is when you evaluate the respiratory value, if it's like low, okay. it's helping. If it's outside the normal range of what the problem is telling you, it's trying to help. If it's within the normal range, it's not doing anything. Uh, that's what, the, that's what the value tells. That's the only difference between the two so far. Okay, let, let's do a third one. And I want to see you guys work it out. 7.25, 48, 30. I'll give you a couple minutes. And I'll check back in. Right, that, that was enough time. Does anyone uh, want to volunteer your answer? second number, that's high. So all we say is, okay, wait, high, low. Oh, that's the cause. Too much CO2 acidifies the blood. So respiratory acidosis does check out. Let's evaluate the third thing, that value, high. Hmm. Okay, let me think about this. High base would help to compensate for low pH, so yeah, that's correct. Okay, let's see here. Any questions on this one? Well, you know, what I did was um, I posted like 10 different problems with their solutions on Canvas this morning. If you felt you needed more practice to kind of like work it through with yourself, with your neighbor, with me. Um, what I want to do now is go go through a, through uh, a few announcements, but there are, are, are there any questions on this material and how to solve these problems? All I'm going to give you are boom, 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 and you just figure it out.
before we take our break, I want to go through a few announcements. Uh, we, we, we all have a sheep kidney dissection. They're in there in the bag. You can't smell them yet because I didn't cut the bag open yet. I'll do that just for you. That's the only thing we're doing that day, and it's not even worth coming in for just a multiple choice test. So it's like that's easily done online, so you don't have to come in. Uh, well, I'm not. <laughs> Take note of that. But just to back it up a little bit, uh, Wednesday is the fourth. The whole time will just be study time, and the same thing with uh, Friday. Now you're. you're your practical in class is um, on Monday the 9th. And I say new format, let me just explain to you, it's not really new. What I've decided to do is, remember how you had those rest stations? Like you do one, two, three, four, and there's like a rest station at the end. What I've decided to do, since all the questions are printed out in those pictures, uh, I'm just gonna like put those four pictures at the rest station so you can review them instead of just sitting there, right? 